Good evening, friends. Welcome. We're glad that you're here at Christian Parenting, Raising Your Kids for Heaven. This is a 10-part series dealing with practical aspects of Christian parenting. Tonight, our topic is understanding your parenting style. I'd like to introduce our guest for this evening, Cinda Osterman. Cinda, welcome to the program. Thank you. We're glad that you are here. Cinda, tell us a little bit about yourself and why do you love working with parents and children? Well, um, it all started when my children were small. I really wanted righteous children. And I had this concept in my mind, and I don't know where I got it from because it wasn't from anybody around me, that you could actually raise children in a way that they would choose to be righteous, and if they didn't choose to be righteous, they would actually come and bring you the implement that you needed to discipline them with and say, I have sinned, would you discipline me? And I didn't share it with anybody, and I'm glad I didn't because somebody would have probably thought, you can't do that. But I didn't know I couldn't do it, so I started doing it, and it actually worked. And so other people started asking, well, how did you have, how are you doing this? What are you doing? So I started sharing, and I was, I was sharing. I have girls, and they said, oh, well, that's why, because you have girls. And I said, okay, Lord. So I went to him, and I said, I want a boy. And I don't want just any boy, but I want a really challenging bad boy. Could you bring me one? And um, two weeks later, I got a phone call from a girl, and she asked, she was having some medical issues and needed me to take her son for six weeks, and she asked if I would take him. And at that time, my girls were teenagers, and I knew that they would be involved in part of this parenting, because I have trained my children as well how to work with the hearts of children also. And um, so we sat down and had a, what we call family powwows. And as we were having a powwow, I said, we got this phone call, and we get to take this little boy. And my girl said, oh, mom, you got to be kidding, not him. And I said, oh, look, God's opportunities. Let's take him. So anyway, he actually came to live with us. And when he first came into the house, I took him into the kitchen, and I opened a drawer, and I said, I want you to look at this. This is called your rod of correction. And when you need it, you're going to bring it to me, and you're going to ask me to use it on you. He said, ah, that's no problem. I'm never going to ask you to use that. And he was five. But two days later, I actually needed to minister the rod of correction. And um, it's different from a spanking, and we'll explain that as we go through. But he brought it to me, and he asked me to use it. And the, that afternoon, his mom called and asked how he was doing. And I said, well, today he had to have his first spanking, as she called it. And um, she said, oh, I'm so sorry. He probably ran around the house and screamed and yelled, because that's what he did with her. And I said, oh, no, he brought it to me. And he said, I've done wrong. Would you discipline me? And she said, when I get back, could we sit down and talk about this? And so from that, I did a set of child training seminars tapes, and they're old. I still have some, but they're old. And um, they started going everywhere. And from that, I started getting a lot of calls. So I started doing camp meetings. And from there, I started actually going into the homes. For 15 years, I actually did child training seminars. And 11 of those years, I actually went into homes and worked with the parent. Well, what is Christian parenting? How would you define that? I would define it as working with the heart of my child in a way that um, I call discipline, discipling them to have the character of Christ. It's really heart work that I'm looking for my children, like I said, to choose obedience, and if they didn't choose obedience, to choose the consequence of what they have chosen. And I believe when we actually work with children, I'm looking to enlist their will and helping them to deny self. So it's really a lot of heart work, and I guess that's what I would call it. So as we go through this um, time together, you're going to be unpacking these different aspects of Christian parenting and discipline, yeah. discipling children. Well, if we look at the world, we see sort of man's method of discipline, man's method of, of raising children. Then we see God's method, the biblical model. Uh, one of the models that we see in the world for raising children, for a better term, uh, ignoring the child when the child misbehaves. That would be man's method. What are some of the ways that parents ignore their children? Okay, now, when I first started, I want you to know all man's ways I tried, and they don't work. And that's when I realized I needed something else. And I went to look for mentors in my church to have somebody help me, and those children weren't, <laughs> they weren't what I wanted. And so I went to the Lord and I said, you have to teach me. I don't know any place to go. And so I'm going to trust that you're going to show me. And he was really good because I did this one ignoring the child. And we had some problems like temper tantrums. 
And the Lord, temper tantrums, one was I would give instructions and they didn't do it, so I'd give it again and I'd give it again and I'd give it again five or six times and they still wouldn't do it. And then um, the other is I was excusing sin. Well, they're in the terrible twos, they're in the troublesome threes, you know, and I was excusing sin. And so the Lord said, "Uh uh-uh, that instead of ignoring the child, we need to respond to the child. And that was his first method. Start responding to any unchrist-like behavior that I saw. Well, let's talk about some of the specifics then. What do you do with a child that has temper tantrums? How do you deal with that? What What have you found works? Okay, well, in my own home, I just actually would grab them, hold them tight, and I would start praying, and I would rebuke that evil spirit by asking Jesus, change the spirit. I know this isn't the spirit of Jesus. Would you make it your spirit so my child reflects your character? And I would hold, pray, and sing, and my children would settle down. And so I started using it in other homes, but these children would bite me. And I thought, ooh, okay, Lord, what are we going to do with this one? I've never encountered, my children never tried to bite me, so I wasn't sure what to do. And at that time, I was listening to a man that was really strong in health named um, Al Wolfson. And he actually worked with an Indian tribe. And what they would do is do a thing called the Indian hold. And you kind of have to wrestle the child because he doesn't really want to sit on your lap. But you actually have the child facing out and you go, underneath their legs and then you grab their arms so their legs are out here their arms are out here and then you hold it out just so and you're not holding hard I'm just keeping the child from biting me and then I just rock back and I have to move my head because they've tried to hit me but they can't bite me they have a hard time kicking and they can't get away and I just hold them and I'm not holding them tight and then I start praying and I ask the Lord please subdue this child so I can talk to the child I sing I pray and I continue until the child settles down and the minute I can feel that body submit and relax, then I turn the child around and we talk. And so I'm not trying to hold them down, like get on top of them. I just didn't feel like that was a good thing to do. But this just kind of holds them, but I'm not squeezing them or anything. So I'm not hurting them, but I'm just keeping them from biting me. What about when you give an instruction and the child disobeys? A lot of parents will count. One, two, three. Uh, What would be God's method when children disobey instruction? Okay, I always have a child follow through. When I say it once, that's it. There's no more discussing. And then I make sure the child follows through. If I have to literally go and help the child. I had a parent living in my, coming to my home. And um, when they're in my home, I want them to be obedient. So I want this child to pick up the toys. And when I ask the child, he just put his hands on his hips like, I'm not going to do that. And I said, oh, we're going to enjoy this. So we went over and picked up a toy, put it in the toy box. I said, isn't it fun to obey? And so that child, right now, I was just having them follow through instruction. I wasn't given really permission to work with the heart of a child. And I don't step in where I'm not allowed to step in. But at the same time, the child was in my home. So I wanted to make sure there was obedience taking place. But I actually will help the child follow through on what I've asked them to do. What about um, giving excuses for your child's behavior? How do we deal with that? Any time that you see an unchristlike behavior, you deal with it. There is no such thing as terrible twos. I actually have worked with babies that have been in my arms. And so there is no such thing. Matter of fact, I was at a camp meeting, and I used to do a lot of camp meetings, and people used to think I must have been, I don't know what they thought, but anyway, they'd bring me all their babies at the end and say, dear, do something. And so I took this baby, and this baby was screaming. I mean, she was really mad. And um, so I just, I told the mother, I said, what we're going to do is I'm gonna hold this baby, and I'm gonna hold her tight, and this is one that you can actually hold, and I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna ask Jesus to change the heart of this baby, and then let this baby come into submission to Jesus. So I actually held the baby, and I started praying, and the mom the whole time was thinking, yeah, sure, and this baby was screaming. I mean, she wasn't crying, and most children, when they get in my arms, are screaming. And so I looked at the baby and I said, it's time for you to go to bed. And I know that you really don't think you need to, but you really do. And I'm going to pray. And if you just surrender to Jesus, he'll help you. You'll close your eyes and you'll go to sleep. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say now. And you're going to close your eyes and you're going to fall asleep. Now, like I said, this baby's screaming and this mother was shaking her head. And so I prayed. And the minute I said amen, I mean, the baby was still screaming. I said amen. And then I said now. And the baby goes, <gasps> And the mom said, how'd you do it? And I said, I didn't. <laughs> God did it. And so the Lord was blessing. So the parent could see that this was happening. So in, in essence, it, it takes faith to believe that if you follow God's principles, that God will do something miraculous yes. for the child, for that situation. 
Yes, but I also would like to stay in your own home. It doesn't work that fast. <laughs> Sometimes it's four hours. I've been at it eight hours, sometimes five minutes, but it doesn't work that fast. But when I was out in the field actually working with parents, I didn't have that kind of time. And the Lord needed to bless my efforts right then. And I tell you, every time I went home, I got on my knees and I just said, Lord, thank you for the power that I saw tonight, because that's not something I always saw immediately when I was working with my own children. Now, what about bribing children to obey? You know, if you obey, I'll give you something, food or whatever, a toy. Yes. That was my other method that I used, was a bribing. And I tried the food thing. I tried M&Ms. But I had t two children that responded quite different to sugar. One would just start knocking off the walls, and the other one would sit in the corner and cry. So I realized the sugar was not the method. So I tried raisins, and I thought that would work. And the Lord showed me that my children, I was really strengthening self by teaching them that, because they would look at my bribe and they say, well, if I like it, I'll do it. If I don't like it, I'm not going to do it. So I was teaching them to have self in control. They looked at what they were being offered, to make the decision rather than choosing to do it. And God's way is to um, work with the child in such a way that you reward him because he is obedient, but not to get obedience. Now, how would that work? I mean, do you have a practical... Yeah. I mean, it's a little confusing between bribing and rewarding. How does that work? Okay. Um, this little boy, when he was in our home, I took him shopping, and I knew that when he shopped, he liked to touch everything. And I don't believe children should be allowed to touch, because when they touch the merchandise, it, the um, store loses money. Because I don't know, I don't buy the one that's all messed up. Do you, any of you? You know, we look for the one that's nice. And so I don't like them touching. And so I knew that he, I try to make obedience as simple as I can. And I asked him, I said, do you know how to put your hands in your pocket? He says, oh, sure, I can do that. Just watch. And he put his hands in and take them out and put them in and take them out. I said, wow, that's really good. That's easy for you. Oh, yeah, it's real easy. Watch. He started going faster, showing me that it's no problem at all. And I said, okay, well, I'm taking you shopping. And I know that it's really hard not to touch everything in the store. So when I take you shopping, what I would like you to do is put your hands in your pocket and leave them there until I ask you to take them out. Do you think you could do that? And he said, sure. So anyway, we went shopping, and his hands were in his pocket. He had a sweatshirt on. And he went to reach for something, and he saw his hand in his pocket, and he said, oh, I'm not to touch. So he put it back down. Then he went to touch with the other hand in the pocket. Oh, my hand's in my pocket. I'm not supposed to touch. So he put it down. Well, then we got to the second store, and I forgot to tell him to put his hands in his pocket, and he was touching everything. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you. Put your hands in your pocket. So he put his hands in his pocket, and we went through that store. And we got to the third store, and we were all done. And we had been shopping for several hours. And by the time we got to the last store, I went to him, and I said, is it really easy for you to keep your hands in your pocket? He said, yeah, watch. And he pulled them out, and he kept going in and out. And I said, so any time we were in the store, you could have taken them out? He said, oh, yeah, it would have been really easy. I said, why didn't you? He said, because you asked me to put them in, and I wanted to obey you. And I said, then that means you chose to obey because you could have taken them out at any time, right? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then I would like to reward you because of your obedience, because you could have not obeyed if you wanted to. So then we went over to look at the toys, and I had two little cars, and I said, I'd like you to pick two of them out. And he had his hands in his pocket, and he was looking at them. I said, now you can take your hands out, because now you're going to buy. So now you can touch. Just be very gentle as you touch. Anyway, he picked out two toys, and on the way out of the store, he started crying. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, it just feels so good to be obedient. And I said, you're right. It does feel good to be obedient. So rewarding a child for making the right choice, but you don't necessarily want to reward them every time they make the right choice. And it's not always the same reward. I reward them every time they make the right choice, but it's not with like a toy or food or anything like that. It may just be, matter of fact, this is what I do most of the time. It's when they choose to be righteous, I say, let's pray and thank Jesus because it's you letting Jesus work in your heart. That's why you're righteous. So let's thank him for allowing that. Or it may be a hug. It may just be um, you set such a good example for me that you help me to be obedient. And it may be something as simple as that, but I always let them know what you have done is special because you've allowed Jesus to work in you. 
Another way that we see the world handling parenting is to threaten the child. Just wait till daddy gets home. I'm going to not let you have dessert. Right. And I did that one too. And when I started working with parents, the one that I heard that hurt me the most is, you're not going to go to heaven. Well, you don't tell a child that. It may be true if we don't have righteous character that we don't go to heaven, but that's not going to motivate them. You know, as a parent, we want to make sure we're working with the heart. And so threatening, instead of threatening, threatening the child, because um, threatening is just like a bribe, only it's something negative. So they will look at the threat. And some children don't mind the threat. It's worth getting in trouble, and they'll take the consequence because they want to do it. And so I don't find that strengthens self. I mean, it does strengthen self. And so I want to make sure that self is taken care of. That you want to help control. them reason from cause to effect? Right, and that's what I teach, cause to effect. And um, this other little boy again, I use him quite a bit because I had so much, well, I've worked with a lot of children, but he comes to mind. We went out walking one um, afternoon, and we were on a path that had been worn down, so there was a lot of high stumps. And um, anyway, he started walking, and I decided to call him over and show him the path. And I said, I want you to look at this path and tell me what you see. He said, oh, those are roots and those are stumps. And I said, that's right. Have you noticed anything about them? He said, well, they're really high. And I said, that's right. And when you try to walk over them, what do you have to do? And he said, well, I have to lift my leg up really high. And I said, that's right, so you don't trip, right? And I said, um, if you walk on the path, you may, you'll see them ahead of time so you can lift your foot and walk over them, and it'll probably be very safe. But if you start running, you could trip on one of those and fall. And you may fall even if you're walking, but it won't hurt as bad as if you're running, because if you run, you've got that force behind you, and you're going to really hurt. And so I would prefer that you walk. And he said, okay. Now he started walking, and it wasn't long before he started running. And I knew right then I could stop him and tell him no, that you need to walk and correct him or whatever. But I believe in letting children reap the consequences of their choices in little things so it doesn't become major things. And I knew he was going to fall. And it's really hard for a parent when you know the child's going to get hurt to go ahead and let them get hurt because you want to protect them. But if you protect them, protect them in the little things, then when the major things come along, then they haven't learned um, the consequences for their actions. And so sure enough, he fell. And I held him, and I hugged him, and we prayed together, and we talked. And then I said, do you see why now I wanted you to walk? And he said, yeah, that really hurt. I said, I know. I said, but you have another choice. You can run again and fall and get hurt, or you can walk. And he said, I think I'll walk. I said, that's a good choice. I would walk too. So what about standards in the home and, and following them through with consequences? How does that work? How important is that? It's very important, and what I do when I actually would work in a home is set up posters where we have a standard and the consequence. And I started with simple standards. Um, some of the ones that we had is turn off the lights when you leave a room because it cost, and if the light wasn't turned off, you owe me a penny. And for a child, a penny is a lot of money, but they learn to turn off the lights. Or playing at the table, if they had to get down from the table. Um, so I had consequences like that. So when a child breaks a standard, you, you don't want to keep bringing up the standard over and over again. You want to start implementing the consequence? Okay, and that's something I find with a lot of parents. You have a standard and a consequence. And you will never get to character development as long as you continue doing the standard over and over and over. Because when you're doing the standard, they already know it. So I tell parents, don't go over every day with the standards. Instead, start every day with new choices. You already know the standards, and when I implement them, we practice them. You know, if we practice doing the lights, we practice the lights, and then they pay me a penny if they don't turn it on, and we practice those so they know what it's like to do both. And once they practice, if they break it, then I go to the poster, and I say, okay, you didn't turn off the light, what's our consequence? You owe me a penny, and they would pay. And so I never, and I tell parents, do not reason. You know what I told you about turning off the lights. Do not negotiate. Would you like to do that again or give them a second chance? I don't do any of those. Instead, I just take them to the standard, show them that it was broken, and then what the consequence is. Now, what happens if they don't want to do the consequence for whatever reason? Okay, I have a couple of those. Um, 
Now, like I said, when we're actually giving standards and consequences, this is the opportunity you get to see the heart of your child. It's not the standard that's going to show you, and as long as you keep implementing that, you will never see the real heart. But the minute they have to do the consequence, that's when you see the heart. If they're submitted, of course, we have a good heart. If they're not submitted, then we have to look at that heart. And I've had um, two types of situations, and I'll explain the first one. When I actually have rebellion at the time, they just say, no, I'm not going to do it. That's when I use what I call the rod of correction. Now, I call that different than a spanking, because spanking is usually a parent is frustrated, they're mad, they're taking it out on the child, and they usually have quite a blow behind that spanking. And so I use what I call the rod of correction. What I would do is tell the child that I'm sorry that you have made that choice. Because of making that choice, sin cost our Savior's life. And so therefore, you have to pay. Somebody had to pay for sin, and if you choose not to pay for it, he paid for it. And so right now, I'm going to meter out the rod of correction and bring you into submission. So I pray. I ask for my child's heart. I always tell them, choose. That's a big word in our home, choose. So I tell them to choose. And then if they choose wrong, I turn them over. I apply that um, rod. And then one time, but where they feel it, but not where I you know, painfully hurt them, but I want them to feel it. Then I turn them back. And I say, now I want you to choose to surrender to Christ. I'm going to pray again, and I'm going to call for your heart. So we pray, call for the heart again. And then I ask them, what would you like to do? If they say no again, I turn them over, I apply it again, and then I turn them back, and we work again. And then when the child says, I, I don't want him to say, okay, okay, okay. That's not what I'm looking for. And I find the rod of correction, the spank, because I used to do spankings, and I got nowhere. My child may do it because of the pain, but it's so different than the rod. When I actually used that, my child would come into repentance. I could see their heart. They would melt in my hands. I could see a change. And then they would do it because they really wanted to do that which was right. And spankings I never found accomplished that at all. So what you're saying is that the focus in parenting is not just simply getting right behavior, no. but it's really forming that heart that loves God, that respects authority, that respects you as a parent. When I was working with my oldest daughter, I came to a situation that she knew that she had done wrong and that she was at a point she needed to take the consequence, but she really didn't want the consequence. And so I went into my room and I asked the Lord, what would you have me to do with her? And the Lord told me that I needed to take the spanking. And like I said, that you make sure that you know that God wants you to do something. Because if not, your child may take pleasure in what they're doing. And I had that situation. A parent called and said, that thing that you said about taking the child, letting the child discipline you doesn't work. My child enjoyed doing it. And I said, well, God, did he tell you to do that? And she said, no. And I said, don't do anything if God doesn't direct you. But this one was a direction from the Lord. So when I gave her the rod of correction, I said, I want you to give me three spankings or corrections, and I want to fill it. And she said, Mommy, I can't do that. And I said, but you didn't take your responsibility. It was your responsibility to take the consequences, and you chose not to, so therefore I will take it for you. So anyway, she took the rod, and she went like this. And I said, no, 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 no. Mommy's got to fill it. And she said, oh, Mommy, please. And I said, if you keep arguing, I'm going to add one more for each time you argue. And she said, I can't even do the three. And I said, then don't argue. So she went, ah, and cried. Every time she spanked, she was crying. And then she threw it down, put her arms around me, and she said, I will never not take my consequences for my choices again. So now the Lord knew that her heart would be repentant in that and that she would choose that. Cinda, another way that we see uh, parenting in the, uh, in the world is that of letting the child rule in the home. The child makes the decision as to what the family's going to eat, where the family's going to go. Um, how does that relate to God's method? Well, first of all, I don't believe that we should let the child rule the home. The parent should rule the home. And I remember when this little boy, he was coming to our house on Monday, and they came over for the weekend, um, and they had a meal with us. And this little boy definitely ruled his home. And so while we were it, eating, out of the blue, he says, he knew he was kind of stay with me. He says, at my house, I go to bed at 9 o'clock. 
And I said, that's nice. At my house, you'll go to bed at 7. He said, at my house, I go to bed at 9. I said, that's nice. At my house, I will go to bed at 7. So you can get up and have your worship time before we eat. At my house, I go to bed at 9. And I said, that's nice. At my house, you'll go to bed at 7. And then he waited for quite a while, and he said, I'm going to be going to bed at 7, huh? <laughs> and I said, yeah, you're right. You're going to be going to bed at 7. And so we can have our children at a very early age start ruling the home. And I find that there's one thing. You know how we talked about earlier how we ignore the child? Well, a lot of parents, when their children were little, and I try this too, you're supposed to just stick them in the bed and let them just scream and cry, and they'll fall asleep, okay? Well, that was one method. Well, then we have parents swinging to the other method that now they're picking the child up and they either take them to bed with them and they hold them until they fall asleep or lay with them. And I'm finding both extremes not working, especially being a teacher, because as you start letting the child, when they scream, holding them, you're actually teaching a character trait that they scream, they get what they want. Well, what happens, by the time they come into my classroom, I have 25 of them that have been getting what they want, and it's really hard to teach, because <laughs> you've got to deal with those characters first before you can e even teach them. So what I say to a parent, instead of letting the child rule, the parent should rule the home. So the minute a child is crying, if you know the child's okay and everything is taken care of, check the child first, make sure they're not wet or anything's hurting, Pray with the child, ask Jesus to subdue the child's spirit and help the child to be obedient, and then put the child back to bed. And the Lord will come in, subdue the heart of that child, and then the child will go to sleep. That way you're not doing one extreme or the other extreme. So I always say respond to the child. What about commanding and forcing the will of a child? Okay, now commanding and forcing the will of a child makes your child really afraid of you. And those are the homes where you actually see the parent telling the child what to do and they just do it. So I was actually one of those parents where I would tell the parent to, um, or I was the parent and I would force my child. And my daughter was really fearful of me. And I realized that's not the way. And so I wanted to enlist the child's will. And that's what we're gonna be talking about later because I'm gonna give you ways that I enlist their will. Thank you, Cinda. Friends, thank you for joining us for this first session of Christian Parenting. We'll be back next time talking about understanding your parenting style, part two. Join us there.